Okay. Hi, everybody. So, I um, had a little trouble with the tech, but I think this is going to work now. Um, hopefully, you're seeing um, some donkeys in front of you. And um, this is the first um, online lecture on, in the epistemology course, and the topic is uh, contextualism. All right, so let's get started. So this is um, epistemic contextualism because it's specifically uh, contextualism about knowledge claims. And um, yeah, so this is not exactly a new theory of knowledge. Um, the idea of a theory of knowledge, it's a bit like having a theory of water or a theory of the heavens. Um, the idea that is that knowledge is this kind of real thing in the world, just as water and the planets are, and we're trying to uh, describe that reality with our theory. Um, whereas contextualism isn't so much a theory about um, the real world as a theory about language. It's not a theory about knowledge, but more a theory about how the word knowledge works, or specifically the language around attributing knowledge to people, saying that uh, Fred knows that such and such, um, Sally knows that she has hands, things like that. So it's a theory about language, uh, not the world. Anyway, let's um, look at how the theory works. So um, let's say we start with a very general analysis of knowledge that hopefully will cover almost everything that we've looked at internalist theories, externalist theories, and so on. Um, for example, the first two conditions that you hopefully can see on your screen that S believes that P and P is true, those are um, held by just about every theory of knowledge. And the third one, um, notice it's very vague. S is in a strong epistemic position. So it doesn't mention justification or reliability or warrant or anything like that um, specifically, but the idea of being in a strong epistemic position is supposed to cover all of those different cases. Um, one thing that you do know, um, one thing about um, condition three, which you should notice, is that it um, talks about being in a strong epistemic position. So clearly this has to be a matter of degree, right? It doesn't talk about that your, it doesn't talk about your epistemic position being perfect or infallible or anything like that. Um, it's something that comes in degrees, and so the um, threshold for what counts as strong can be moved around. That's the basic idea. We have now variable variable standards, depending on the context. Uh, standards governing how strong your epistemic position needs to be in order to have knowledge, how much justification, how much reliability, things like that. Okay. So um, one of the strong uh, reasons to accept EC or epistemic contextualism, this is a quote from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy here, is that uh, it, you're supposed to be able to solve certain puzzles about knowledge, especially uh, skeptical puzzles. How is it you know, we can ha know that we have hands uh, if we don't even know that we're not a brain in a vat? Things like that, right? Um, and it's also supposed to sort of fit within our everyday knowledge attributing practices. That is, you know, it's supposed to explain why we say certain things and then we don't say other things. Okay. Now, um, contextualism then is one of is a certain type of um, philosophical theory. Um, it's a theory of the sort where rather than trying to um, analyze the world, we're uh, instead trying to analyze language. And um, so it's a view, um, especially of um, Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein, we probably haven't mentioned too much, but in the 20th century, um, mid 20th century, there was a philosopher called Wittgenstein, who actually thought that all philosophical problems were just um, based on confusion about language. Um, 
Now that's a bit extreme, but uh, anyway, contextualism is a view of that sort, that what we need is not a better understanding of the world, but a better understanding of how language works, so we can stop getting confused. All right. Um, okay, well, in terms of context dependence, let's talk about that, context dependence language. We're all pretty familiar with such terms. Um, we use them every day. Things like here, for example. I mean, you might have been on the phone with someone in another country, and um, you tell them, yeah, it's raining here. And they say, no, no, it's actually sunny here. Well, they're not likely to say that, but ma imagine they did. No, no, you're wrong. It's not, it's, not, uh, it's not raining here, it's sunny. Of course, that'd be kind of a joke because um, you're in different places, so uh, you've got two different meanings of here. Okay, and we, we never get confused by that. Um, you can make jokes about it, but, um, you know, uh, we, we don't get mixed up. Tomorrow, same way. Um, you know, you said, you, you said you'd pay me back tomorrow. Yes, and I will. I'm going to pay you back tomorrow. Uh, but no, that was yesterday, so tomorrow is today. No, no, I'll, you know, I'll pay you back tomorrow. Anyway, so we don't get confused by these things. Um, yeah, but the idea of contextualism here is that um, words like no and realize and so on are also context sensitive in a way that perhaps we um, weren't aware of. Um, so here's an example of um, another such example of context sensitivity. There's a, um, a player in the NBA, a basketball player called Chris Paul. And uh, there he is on the right there. And I think it's uh, LeBron James next to him. And um, you can see he looks pretty short, right? And in fact, he is known as one of the shortest players, or maybe even the shortest player, I can't remember, but he's, anyway, he's a short player in the NBA. Um, but, uh, you know, when he's just sort of um, hanging out in normal life, dropping his kid off at the daycare or whatever, going shopping, um, he's a, you know, somewhat tall guy. He's, I think, six foot one. So he's taller than me anyway. And, you know, I'm, I'm not short. Um, I'm a little taller than average for a guy. So, you know, he shouldn't be considered a short player anyway. Uh, sorry, he shouldn't be considered a short person, but he is a short NBA player. Okay, but again, none of us get confused by this kind of thing. Um, yeah, so uh, I was talking about Wittgenstein and how he thought that actually all philosophical problems were um, just the result of confusion about language. Um, and he has a nice uh, um, metaphor for that. Uh, he f talks about the fly bottle, which um, is, is pictured uh, there. Hopefully you can see that. Um, and he says, Wittgenstein says, the purpose of philosophy is to show the fly the way out of the fly bottle. So um, obviously a fly in this bottle, it gets in rather easily from below. Uh, attracted by the smell of the liquid, maybe. But then when it tries to fly away, the programming in its little fly brain just says, go towards the light or fly upwards. And it keeps banging into this glass, this invisible uh, barrier. And it, its little fly brain doesn't understand glass, so it just keeps going. It just goes, bzz, 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 just kind of banging into the glass over and over again. And for Wittgenstein, this is sort of uh, like watching a philosopher trying to solve a philosophical problem. Um, there's an easy solution, so to speak, just to um, understand the way language works. And uh, then the problem kind of disappears. Um, anyhow, it's a bit dismissive of philosophy and, and not too many people hold the view uh, today that uh, all philosophical problems are like that. But you know, there, there probably are some such problems. I mean, we can all get confused by language now and again. So you should always keep it in the back of your mind when you're looking at a philosophical problem. Maybe it is one of those ones that Wittgenstein talked about, just a confusion about language. Um, okay. By the way, if you're, you know, wondering why you haven't heard much about Wittgenstein these days, he was kind of a cult figure in a chunk of the 20th century. In fact, even when I was in grad school, started grad school in 1990 or so, um, the first thing I had to do was um, join a, a seminar 
which was going through Wittgenstein for, it seemed like months. And we'd read, I think, the philosophical investigations and these rather cryptic passages, um, trying to figure out what they meant. But the thing was that um, even though there were varying interpretations among the group that we were reading, um, we knew that uh, whatever Wittgenstein meant, it was right. Okay, or at least <laughs> that was the that was the assumption. Uh, that you know, some of us started to to lose that assumption after a few weeks, but uh, at least that that was the the idea that we were supposed to supposed to just know that Wittgenstein was right, even if we couldn't yet understand him. Okay, and uh, here's Paul Horich referring to uh, Wittgenstein nowadays. He says that his writing is self-indulgently obscure. Well, that sounds right. And uh, <laughs> there's little of intellectual value. Well, certainly I couldn't find much. Anyway. All right, so I think we've, we've said this already. This is Jennifer Nagel, by the way, um, whose reading is on the iWeb as an optional reading. It wasn't covered in the quiz, but it's worth looking at. It's fairly short. Um, yeah, so again, she's saying it's not a theory of knowledge as such. It's not trying to define this thing in the world called knowledge. It's a theory about how language works surrounding knowledge. Okay, now, um, which problems does it solve? Uh, why would one uh, want to be an epistemic contextualist? Well, skepticism seems to be the big thing, at least certain kinds of skepticism or it provides a response to certain skeptical arguments. That's the idea. Um, and today we're going to focus on one in particular, this um, transmissibility argument that we previously looked at, um, particularly when, um, well, we looked at it when we were discussing Nozick and then we looked at it again, uh, discussing skepticism. Yeah, so I think you remember how this works. Um, first premise says, I don't know that I'm not a brain in a vat, B-I-V, brain in a vat, okay? Uh, why, why don't I know that? Because um, there's no empirical evidence, there's no observations that I can make to count against it. That's, that's the general idea. If I were a brain in a vat, then everything would look exactly as it does. So um, experience is kind of neutral between the brain in a vat hypothesis and the external world hypothesis. So, um, you know, I can't have knowledge without evidence, something along those lines. Okay, so also just um, rather straightforwardly, if I am a brain in a vat, then I'm just a brain. I have no hands, I have no legs, you know, nothing um, except a brain. So premise two seems right. And then we have this epistemic closure principle that if, if you know something P and you just kind of see that Q follows from P, well then, surely you know that Q. Uh, in other words, you can kind of expand your initial knowledge set by um, logical deductions from things you know. All right, then, you know, the logic goes through, uh, as we saw before, and it turns out the conclusion number six, I don't know that I have hands, which is pretty shocking. Um, right, that's a very strong, skeptical conclusion. All right, so what does contextualism have to say about this? Well, um, they, they say that, uh, you know, I guess this is kind of a classic philosophical answer when, when you ask a philosopher, you know, um, do you know such and such? Um, at least the stereotype of a philosopher is they're supposed to answer something like, well, it all depends on what you mean by no. Right. Um, and that's kind of what a contextualist is saying. Do you know that you have hands? Well, it depends on the context. In an everyday context, you know, you ask someone, do you have hands? And of course, they're going to say yes. Um, because, you know, um, what are the alternatives to having hands? You know, maybe have, do you know that your hands weren't amputated yesterday or do you know that your hands aren't actually made of plastic? Um, of course, they know these things aren't the case, right? So they rightly say yes. Um, but when you ask this skeptical question, are you sure you're not a brain in a vat? Now we have a different context. Um, suddenly, the threshold, the standard 
of justification or whatever, um, however you're defining knowledge, the standard for whatever you need for knowledge is, is shot way up, right? And so the meaning of no has changed. If the meaning of no is that you have a true belief that meets this standard, if the standard changes, then the meaning of knowledge changes. And now it turns out that you don't know. You don't know that you're not in the brain of that, okay? Uh, there's a different meaning of knowledge. All right, so here's uh, someone else saying it, Keith DeRose. Uh, the fact that the skeptic can install very high standards, which we don't live up to, has no tendency to show that we don't satisfy the more relaxed standards that are in place in ordinary conversations. Okay, so what the skeptic does, uh, as I just said, is sort of jack up the standard of something, justification maybe, that's needed for knowledge. Um, so the contextualist kind of has it both ways. On the one hand, our ordinary claims to knowledge are safeguarded, right? The skeptic can't touch those um, because with an ordinary context, lower standard of justification, we do know those things. But at the same time, we can also explain why the skeptical arguments have some force. They have some um, sort of common sense purchase on us. Uh, why don't we just sort of shake them off as silly? We're inclined to take them seriously. So, we have, have it both ways. Um, yeah, that's what we're just saying. So the, the, the skeptical argument, the transmissibility argument seems persuasive because um, the kind of idiots that we are, we're unaware of how language works. Um, we don't know that nose changes its meaning according to the context. So contextualism is an error theory. An error theory in philosophy is a theory according to which ordinary people with their common sense understanding are making a mistake. Um, so, you know, when Copernicus, for example, proposed uh, that the Earth was a planet in orbit around the sun, this was certainly an error theory at the time. It was a theory that ordinary people who, who thought the Earth was stationary, and in fact, not just ordinary people, but, you know, uh, philosophers too, Aristotelian philosophers, um, they were just wrong about that. You know, it was just false, according to Copernicus, that the Earth um, was stationary. And so contextualists think in a straightforward way uh, that common sense is wrong about the meaning of no. Usually we think it's just uh, a word that is not context dependent, but actually it's context dependent. Um, also note that the, uh, the closure principle actually holds according to contextualism. Um, Assuming you um, fix the meaning of no throughout the argument, um, either you're using it with the high standards of justification uh, that it has when we're talking about skeptical scenarios or the ordinary lower standards, um, whichever meaning of no you have, if you keep it fixed, then the closure principle is going to hold, and but just some of the premises are going to going to go wrong. Um, so, you know, like if you knew, if you, let's go back here. Um, for example, if we're talking about low standards, then then you do know you're not in a brain and fat. So the premise one fails. Um, um, but, you know, if you're talking about high standards, then, um, you know, you don't know your brain and a vat. Okay. Um, anyway, we don't have to give up the um, closure principle um, in order to be contextualists, what is in fact happening in that, okay, so if, if you have a problem where you say, I know I have hands, but I don't know I'm not a brain in a vat, then you're essentially committing a fallacy of equivocation. So equivocation is where you shift from one meaning of a word to another you switch between meanings, and if you do that in the course of an argument, then it's a fallacy, of course. Like if I say, um, you know, the press should report on matters that are in the public interest. Okay, that's that's right. And then I say, there is a lot of public interest in um, the private lives of movie stars, like, you know, um, can't think of any right now, or like the private lives of royalty, like uh, what are they called, P uh, Prince Harry and, uh, and Meghan, um, 
whatever her name is. Okay, so the, there's a lot of public interest in that, and therefore the the, uh, the press should report on the private lives of the royal family. Clearly, in that case, I've I've changed the meaning of, of in, uh, public interest. Um, one meaning was uh, that it's sort of for, for the public benefit, the public needs to know this, and the other one is just kind of public curiosity, um, which is a very different meaning. Okay, yeah, so that's what's happening in the transmissibility argument according to um, the contextualist. Yeah, um, now I said that contextualism can be sort of layered on top of Pretty much any um, any uh, existing uh, theory of knowledge. Now, I guess that doesn't include infallibilist theories of one kind or another. Uh, for example, if you're an internalist infallibilist and you think that infallible justification is needed for knowledge, then there's no sort of varying standards going on. Uh, there's just one fixed standard of 100% justification. So um, you can't be a contextualist about that. And the same, I suppose, if you're an externalist, infallibilist, where you need uh, your theory to be authorized by God or something, and that's just an all or nothing thing. Um, anyway, setting those aside, um, you can be either an externalist or an internalist about contextualism. And um, let's look at internalist contextualism first. So, Knowledge on this view is, is justified true belief, plus, I guess, something to satisfy Gettier. Um, and then simply the degree of justification required for knowledge depends on the context. Okay, Feldman considers this. He says, um, you know, we have ordinary standards, um, but then when we're discussing skepticism, we have higher standards of justification. And then once we have those higher standards, attributions of knowledge are typically not true. Okay, now what about externalism? Here there's a wide variety of views. And you might wonder which of them can sort of um, have externalism, uh, sorry, contextualism layered on top. Um, well, basically I think any of the ones that have a degree of something going on for example, process reliabilism, um, you have to have a reliable process. And so maybe the degree of reliability um, needs to increase in skeptical contexts, like the, the error rate has to go down, or maybe the range of circumstances over which the process is reliable has to change, like increase or decrease. Um, that's one possibility. Also, Nozick's truth tracking reliabilism um, the main conditions don't seem like they can be uh, made more or less strict, but it does refer to close possible worlds. So, um, you know, depending on the context, maybe you have to enlarge or reduce uh, the set of possible worlds over which um, your beliefs track the truth. Okay. Um, now, one externalist uh, version of contextualism that both uh, Nagel and Feldman mention is the relevant alternatives theory. I have to admit that this this theory seems a bit vague to me and I'm not exactly sure what it means. Um, it might be that there's just various versions of it. Uh, that's maybe the source of my confusion. But anyway, I'm just going to tell you about it as much as I know. Um, so one example that, that Nagel uses, and I think even Feldman too, is that suppose you're in a normal zoo and you are looking at a zebra or a zebra, where I come from. Um, now, knowing that you're looking at a zebra certainly means that you can um, sort of rule out it's being a lion or a giraffe, you know, and other sort of typical animals that you'd find at a zoo. Um, but now suppose you're not at a normal zoo, you're at a zoo run by jokers, or maybe one with a very tight budget that couldn't afford a real zebra, so they decided to, um, you know, paint up a donkey to look like a zebra. Um, in, a, in that different context, which kind of reminds me of fake barn county, but anyway, uh, in that different context, you to know that it's a zebra, you'd have to rule out it being things like a painted donkey. Okay, so just to show some nice pictures here, there's 
that's what a zebra looks like and um, there's a picture of a painted donkey um, obviously we could fairly easily tell the difference there but you can imagine that if the paint job was done better and maybe you were further away then um, you know it wouldn't be easy to tell all right now um, now I'm not quite sure what determines the set of relevant alternatives um, or sometimes they say salient alternatives um, I mean sometimes they talk as if it's being in a different environment or rather your environment determines this um, so maybe um, you know when you're in a normal county um, a fake barn is not a relevant alternative to a real barn you just have to distinguish between a barn and a, and a house and a tree and so on um, but in fake barn county you know you do have to make that distinction I don't know um, because certainly Feldman um, also talks about if someone asks you you know do you know you're not a brain in a vat or you know raises some other possibility like maybe that's so-and-so's twin brother you know um, just asking the question changes the set of relevant alternatives it seems um, so I'm not quite sure about that but anyway in the latter case um, it does seem that epistemic closure is going to fail uh, the idea there is that um, throughout the argument the uh, transmissibility argument we were just looking at the meaning of knowledge is actually fixed there's no equivocation but depending on what you're talking about whether you're talking about having hands or being a brain in a vat um, a set of relevant alternatives changes and so um, epistemic closure actually fails as it does for Nozick if you remember um, anyway yeah so Nagel makes it clear um, that on her understanding of the relevant alternatives theory um, you know you know that it's a zebra you know that if it's a zebra then it's not a donkey um, but you don't know that it's not a donkey right um, so that's clearly a failure of the epistemic closure principle anyway I'll let, I'll let you puzzle that out if you're inclined to uh, work on this at all um, yeah um, so the idea there is that the you know the skeptics questions just being asked you know creates makes possibilities salient or relevant when they previously weren't um, now Nagel seems to take it for granted that uh, losing epistemic closure is pretty crazy and it does kind of seem that way I think we saw a case before where um, you can uh, know that the thing that you're looking at is a, a red barn but you can't know that it's a barn uh, which seems odd because of course if it's a red barn then it is a barn that, that follows rather straightforwardly and it just seems crazy that we could know you know the first without the second I'm not going to go on to that go on about that again um, I think we also saw that according to Nozick it's actually a positive thing about his view that you know it denies epistemic closure anyway let's look at some other problems for um, the um, the contextualist view um, one is that it doesn't seem to help at all with the problem of induction this is a quote actually from the end of um, uh, Feldman's section on contextualism he seems to raise it just as a, um, a problem for the relevant alternatives theory but it seems to be true of contextualism generally that um, contextualism doesn't really help with the problem of induction at least as I see it you know certainly if empiricism is true and as you know I see empiricism as kind of the uh, source of the problem of induction um, if empiricism is true you can't have any knowledge at all about unobserved matters um, you know for example about the future or about um, what's going on in other galaxies or uh, what the structure of the universe is whether the earth's moving or not um, and so you know if your degree of justification about these unobserved matters is, is kind of zero you have zero information um, then lowering the standard there is not going to help so, so here's an analogy suppose you you set a final exam and uh, a lot of people fail but uh, most of those who failed got at least 40 percent they didn't make 50 percent but they at least got 40 um, 
then you say, well, I'm going to lower the passing grade to 40%, and then a lot of people pass. Okay, well, you know, that's possible. But if everybody's getting zero, um, then, you know, that's not really going to work anymore. Um, if you lower, I guess if you lower the pass mark to zero, then you're not going to distinguish between people who at least tried, or at least showed up to some lectures, and people who didn't even write the exam at all. So, um, you know, we, we can't lower the standard justification to zero, right, which we'd have to do um, solve the problem of induction, it seems. Um, also with Gettier, um, does contextualism help at all with the Gettier problem? This is one of the main things that we've been uh, working on this, this course. Um, and it, it doesn't seem that it would help at all, as far as I can tell, because, um, you know, Linda Zagzewski has this kind of recipe for making Gettier counterexamples, and the recipe seems to work for any um, case if you can have a highly justified false belief, all right? And it seems that you could have those justified false beliefs even for very highly justified beliefs. So um, it's not just a case of um, changing the standard of justification to fix Gettier. Um, that's not going to help. Um, and maybe this response to the skeptic is not that plausible anyway, um, particularly because of the fact that, in general, when language is context dependent, we're well aware of it. I mentioned that nobody gets confused about the fact that Chris Paul is, is sort of tall um, when he's dropping off his kids at daycare, but he's short on the basketball court, you know. Uh, nobody gets confused about that, or how it can be one person says it's raining here and another person says, no, no, it's sunny here. There's no contradiction. How can we get all uh, confused like the poor fly in the fly bottle um, when we start talking about knowledge? Um, it seems a bit unlikely that we would get confused about that if that's all the problem was. Um, anyway, and Feldman makes that same argument. Well, um, I think that's all I have to say about contextualism. Um, keep your eyes posted on your email inboxes for instructions about how to log into tomorrow's Zoom session. Um, I'll send a sheet of instructions. Basically, you just have to find um, Zoom on Google and, and install it for free on your computer, ideally. You can also do it on a phone or an iPad or something, tablet. Um, works best, apparently, on a computer. And then if you click on the link uh, in the email that I send you, then it should, you know, transport you magically into this virtual classroom, and you'll see all these heads on your screen, and you can talk to them. Uh, anyway, look forward to that. Um, see you tomorrow.